Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good evening. This presentation normally takes two hours, but I'm going to give it in three minutes. Allow me to start. Uh, the previous speakers talked about, you know, if you have success stories, shout them out. Let me just shout these stories on Rwanda. Uh, Rwanda is the fastest growing, uh, sixth fastest growing economy in Africa. I think Uganda is ahead of us in that. And uh, uh, we are the safest country, uh, fifth safest country in the world. Uh, lowest ratio of corruption. There is zero corruption or zero tolerance uh, policy in, in Rwanda. We have a business friendly environment. We, have, uh, we are a regional platform for IT and we are an IT ready state. That is the success story. How did we get there? I think what it calls for, for every country, is just to set the basics right. And I thank the, the uh, honorable speakers and the previous speakers from uh, Uganda, what they talked about, not only Uganda, but entire region, and making reference to Rwanda in some cases. And what Rwanda did was to set up policies and institutions that create a big, uh, good, uh, friendly environment uh, for business. And uh, there we rank one of the best countries where it is easy to do business. Second is to act, enact uh, policies that are business uh, friendly and setting up appropriate institutions. In Rwanda, you will hear of institution called Rwanda Development Board. That is your gateway into Rwanda. You want to know about business opportunities, information about business, having your business registered, it is all in one stop shop in Rwanda. And entire process takes less than six hours and you have your registration certificate. Ladies and gentlemen, there are quite a lot of opportunities for investment in Rwanda. I will just say the headlines. If you want the details, you come to me later. There is in manufacturing, especially light manufacturing, in mining and aquiring, we have agriculture and agro-processing. I can't agree more with the previous speakers who talked about value addition. In BPOs and ICT, in knowledge and education, in finance, in tourism, in housing, and in real estate, in infrastructure development, in energy and water, plus many more. If you want details on this, I will uh, get in touch with you later. The biggest challenge on uh, uh, our economies has always been size of the market. I thank Uganda and uh, the president of Uganda for his lead in creating uh, active and operational regional economic uh, blocks. So the East African community, COMESA, and Africa are providing good opportunities for business people in the region. You may ask, how do you get in Rwanda? We have a direct Rwanda air flight from London to Kigali. <laughs> Meanwhile, as we wait for Uganda Airlines to start, don't hesitate to use Rwanda Air. And it flies every day of the week. So you are welcome to Rwanda and continue to Uganda. Thank you so much. My name is Joseph Kavacheza. I come from Rwanda. Not Uganda. When I say Rwanda and the Uganda, people tend to confuse. We, we, we are we, neighbors, yes. And remember uh, the, I, the... Sorry? The, the borders were colonial decisions. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and uh, I work with the High Commission here. I oversee trade and investment matters. Uh, the small question I have for Engineer David. Uh, you know, uh, infrastructures, especially roads, uh, those that are most expensive and uh, private people don't want to come in free. But he talked of uh, user pay type of roads. Who invests in these? Uh, I was thinking of 
a highway from Kampara to Kigali on a private user way, uh, a private investor coming in, putting it up. I think that would relieve the burden from government. Are there private investors willing to come into developing such projects? Thank you. Now, the issue of whether the private sector can really invest in roads, uh, we have a number of examples. I'll begin with, uh, okay, this is like a hypothetical. Look at the company of Express where government borrowed money and the private and the road users actually the first charge of the money being collected is going towards repaying the loan. So government borrowed money from China Exim Bank. That money, whatever toll collections we make, we put them in an escrow account, take off the oper operating costs, and they go the, the, the balance is, is goes towards uh, loan service. Government provides the subsidy to be able to cover that up. Now, why we are trying to seek the private sector, government doesn't have the money to provide the infrastructure we need now. And we cannot wait for forever. Now, if you go to Nairobi, Nairobi, they have this system of elevated highways. These are, these are, this is a purely private investment. And whoever uses that highway pays. And it can be modeled and somebody can come and invest and it can recover the investment over an agreed concession period and the, the city gets rid of the traffic jam. Users who don't want to sit in jams can be able to pay and enjoy journey, journey certainty. If you want to get the airport in 30 minutes, you get there in 30 minutes. You don't, you don't have to wait for an hour or three hours, even miss your flight. So that's the model on which we're trying to pick it up. And we're not short of interested suitors who will be able to take it on. And another project which we're implementing, again, it's going to be a private investment, is the elevated light rail project. Now, our plan in the future is to make, make sure we get rid of border borders in the city. So that border borders stop being the main source of people movement in the city. If we do the elevated light rail, we shall be able to say, but the borders get out of the city, users have an alternative. It becomes like a bus rapid transit, people can pay for use, and the investment is recovered through user charges. Now, when we go to the issues of walkways, uh, disability facilities, green spaces, all the new roads we're implementing, either using World Bank funding or African Development Bank, okay, borrowed facilities, or even government of Uganda facilities, must have walkways embedded and uh, disability facilities also provided. Previously, this wasn't the case, but all new infrastructure, all new infrastructure we're implementing, are, it's a requirement they must have these facilities provided. Now, I'll give you an example, the flyover phase one. We're going to acquire the, where, where the electric commission is, is going to be converted into a green space so the public can be able to enjoy it. Of course, due to impunity, most of the green spaces have been occupied and taken over. But moving forward, we're trying to recover them. Then, border borders. The issue of border borders is a serious issue. The main vehicle of crime in the city is border borders. Uh, most biggest source of accidents in the city is border borders. About 10 people die every day due to border 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 activities. So we're trying to get rid of border borders where we're heading in the future. It may be a source of comfort now, but you don't know what's happening to the innocent public who don't know that these riders are not trained to be on the roads. So we're moving, trying to move towards streamlining border border activities in the city. Now the car free day, uh, as you know, Kampala has, Kampala has a it's one of the most polluted cities in the, in, the, in the world, I should speak at the moment. Now, this car free day, free day concept is intended to promote clean air, encourage walking, so that people can be able to know that we can begin to reduce the, I mean, improve the air quality standards in the city. So, the air, car free day is going to be on the 7th of September, 2024, and we're going to begin encourage, encouraging people to ride to work, walk to work, so that they can be able to reduce the pollution in the city. Then the issue of misuse of facilities. Again, this goes to mindset change. People need to become responsible. Users need to become responsible. Why should a border border ride on a walkway? Why should somebody build in a green space? So we we'll, we are holding a number of awareness campaigns so that people know that they need to become responsible to improve the quality of life in the city. I guess I've tried to cover most of the questions that Thank were asked. Thank you. I, I wanted to touch a little bit about uh, mass transport because I, I did hear some time in a report that we needed about 3,000 buses for mass transport to fix Kampala mass transport. Was that a true number? Uh, of course, we signed off a concession agreement with a company called Metu, which is supposed to deploy about 2,000 buses in the city. 
Uh, of course, the challenge with that is that if you don't build dedicated bus lanes, it will become like a big uh, minibus. So the investors got in some challenges, uh, hoping that we build the dedicated lanes that will help his business work out. So currently, the number we're planning to deploy is about 2,000 buses um, in the city. Just again for clarity, is that an exclusive concession license or can members in the room also come and get concession licenses? Uh, that is an exclusive license. Uh, he has exclusivity to be able to recover his investment for the risk he's taking. So he has an exclusivity for a period of 15 years. Um, well, a, a, an example, a recent example in London is the new Elizabeth Line, which if anybody hasn't been on it yet, it's amazing. Uh, thank you. Um, so it's an amazing new train line uh, going right from East London to West London um, under the city. Um, it was funded by government money, but it was also funded by, there's a membership organization called Business LDN, used to be called London First, if anyone's familiar with that. And they're a membership organization of the biggest corporates in London, representing at least 25% of the GDP of London. Um, and they put fun funding into that project. So it was government and, in effect, private from mem members of a business membership organization. For us, as I say, what, what we do is we partner up from the start to make sure that a project is a priority. Mm -hmm. If it is a priority, the government is going to back it. Mm -hmm. If the government back it, there's multiple resources for finance. Uh, to touch on what Francois was talking about earlier, They're, they have one to two billion worth of finance and available through UKF for Uganda. Mm -hmm. So if the project is a priority, mm -hmm. the financing sh should never become an issue. So if I get a project and I stall, I can come back to UKF and we can move forward with it. In the, in the <laughs> original answer I was giving you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me take it to Ms. It, it, it's a challenge we have across the region, so I'm not, we're not just talking about Uganda, it's a challenge, so we'd like to see what we have on that since we're talking infrastructure today. Yes, I feared it was going to end up like that. Each time you ask a question about finances, uh, am I the last one or can I give to somebody else? No, 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 <laughs> it ends at you, sir. No, I, th I think you're right. I mean, if, if we have the capacity, we will certainly look at the project. Now, those projects tend to be complex projects. And what we see from experience is you have different financial stakeholders who will look at it. And it's important to keep that in mind because you can get sources of funding which are cheaper from other financial stakeholders. What we give is link, as I mentioned, to the UK export. And I think when you look at those projects, you really have to look at all what's on offer and end up with a kind of a blended funding if you want. Okay. But if the project is good, if we, have, if we are satisfied with the risk and the, the counterparty risk, and if we get the right support from the authorities, yes, we look at those projects. Okay. Great, thank you, thank you so 